In this lecture, we looked at the differences in pea release from natural and anthropogenic sources of phosphorus. The difference in pea release from these sources would naturally affect the water quality that is leaving the location. We have seen previously that total P is not an indicator of P that is lost from a soil. Natural P sources such as phosphatic soils and risk assessment implications were discussed in Module 2, Lecture 5. The solubility of P in a P source differs substantially and therefore P loss potential is different for P sources with the same TP concentrations. And we also discussed malic 1P and water soluble P variations among different P sources. With this background, let us look at differences in P loss risk from natural and anthropogenic sources paying particular attention to some of the other components of the P source. Here is a schematic diagram of a typical dairy. Of course, the diagram varies substantially depending on the actual dairy. But the one thing that we need to note is that the intensive and holding areas where the cattle are held at night and during feeding and so on and is the area closest to the barn and therefore the pea release from this area is supposed to or is expected to be highest versus a pasture or a forage area which is further away from the barn and the dairy activities. Let us just look at water soluble pea and total pea in many of impacted soils. These are surface soils from various land uses in the Lake Okeechobee Basin. They range from, as you have seen earlier, intensive in holding areas, pasture, forage, beef pasture, and native areas. And these native areas that are specified here are non-phosphatic in nature and are representative primarily of surface horizons of the Lake Okeechobee Basin spore salts. If you'll notice, the highest water soluble P and total P are in the intensive and holding areas and the lowest of course is in the native areas where there have been no other anthropogenic activities and they are at the same time non-phosphatic. Now let us look at water soluble P in inorganically fertilized soils. The horizons are shown at the x-axis and the water soluble P on the y axis. You will find that there is more than one E horizon, E1, E2, again E2 and E2. These are simply differences in the increments of the sampling process. It still represents the E horizon. The same is true of the BH horizons. Now what we notice is the inorganic P does not accumulate in surface horizons. Uh, just that is at the AP, the amount of inorganic water extractable P is minimal, almost zero in the E horizons, which has no P retaining capacity as we, as we have seen several times before. The P moves down the soil and then accumulates in the lower horizons, such as the BH horizon. And in this particular case, the BH1, the various BH horizons, including the BH2, has been impacted. Here's the X-ray diffraction pattern of a spodosol clay fraction. If you look at the surface horizon of the spodosol, the soils that are predominant in the Lake Okeechobee Basin, it's primarily quartz with little P retention capacity. That means it will have a low iron and aluminum. The three plots here are the A, E, and BH horizon. Of course, the BH horizon is different. It contains materials such as gypsite, hydroxy interlayered vermiculite, kaolinite, and quartz. However, heavy manure impacted soils are able to retain 
high concentrations of P and release P continuously. Well, that is the difference between the inorganic P and the manure impacted P. Now we look at the X-ray diffraction of a paleodiled clay fraction. Just look at the difference. Here, the A horizon contains materials such as hydroxy, interlayered bermiclite, kaolinite, and quartz, whereas quartz was the only material that we noticed in the spodosol soil profile of the A horizons. Now, we move on to have a look at the Kissimmee River floodplain. The, this, the channelization of the Kissimmee River in the 1960s led to the degradation of the ecosystem in the river basin. Attempts have since the 1990s been made to restore portions of the Kissimmee River and floodplain. The sensitivity of chemical physical soil parameters to change in floodplain condition in the Kissimmee River Basin, uh, that is for the areas that have been already resolved, restored, that is the phase one, and the areas to be restored, that is phase two. Just remember though that these were done much earlier, it's around 2011, 2012, and therefore things would have changed by now. Surface soil samples, zero to 10 centimeters, from 230 predetermined sites from both phase one and phase two were sampled. And now let us take a look at the landscape and vegetation of the Kissimmee River Basin. Uh, the landscape includes the channels which are active, abandoned, passive, and the remnant of the river channels. We have black backfill, as well as the floodplain zone, the spoil, the upper ecotone, and others, which of course includes the road ditch, the farm ditch, tributary slope, pit, burrow area, etc. The vegetation is variable, ranging from aquatic vegetation, broadleaf marsh, wet prairie, upland forest, upland shrub, herbaceous and upland shrub, and finally the wetland forest and shrub. like you to take a particular look at the location of the spoil which is in deep red because we'll be making use or we'll be referring to the soil area in subsequent slides. And now let's look at the ecosystems and the TP, total calcium, magnesium, iron, and aluminum. I'm not going to details, but if you look at the spoil area, you'll find that it invariably has higher concentrations of total P, total calcium, total magnesium, and to some extent, total iron and total aluminum as well. So they are a little bit different from the rest of the ecosystems we are discussing here. And of course, the other here means the road ditch, the farm ditch, tributary slough, pit, burrow area, etc. Now let us look at some of the total P and water soluble P values of the Kissimmee River Basin. What we notice is the water soluble P is low in the spoil material, although the TP is high. If you recall the old a figure where we had the red spoil area runs right through uh, the, from the north through the f uh, phase one and phase two. And here we find that the water soluble P is not very high. At the same time, you have high total P values. We will move on to take a look at the pH and malic one metals of this area. What you notice that in the spoil area, you have a high pH of 7.93. The dairy holding area has also a high pH, but there are other properties of the material that are different. For example, the malic one calcium and the malic one magnesium are invariably higher than a dairy holding manure impacted soil. 
and the spoil materials somewhat has got um, a similar values or probably not some similarity in values in the, even the floodplain though the floodplain has got a low very low pH now let us look at the SPSC values in phase one higher negative SPSC and higher water soluble P in between phases one and two suggests that there is a potential for P release from this location. Negative SPSC in this location is likely a combination of spoiled material and anthropogenic activities. So see if you have negative and you have high water soluble P, it does not necessarily, you can't actually relate it to either anthropogenic or natural conditions. This is phase two, and again, I'll just take you down to the the, the, um, in the area between phase one and phase two, where you notice very high negative water soluble P. And in summary, anthropogenic P sources, example manure, can accumulate substantial amounts of P in surface sandy horizons. Inorganic P is generally not retained in surface horizons of spodosols. Spoil material contain high total P concentrations. P is released continuously from heavily manure impacted soils and as you know it is because of the weak calcium magnesium P bonding and then you will notice you get higher water soluble P in sequential extracts. P is also released continuously from spoil, that is uh, phosphatic material, which may be uh, what has been exhumed um, from the geological deposits. And of course, you may have the additional contributions, P contributions from other anthropogenic activities let us say from cattle grazing, cattle congregation near feedlots, improved pastures, etc. at that particular location. We end here with a couple of references that we have used in this particular lecture.